morning. I'm Rebecca, one of the pastors here at Cokesbury. So happy to see all of you this morning. We're so happy to have with us Mary Ann Fennell this morning on the violin. Could we welcome her? Welcome to worship and to another installment of the Summer Reading Series. This is your first time with us. We want to welcome you and hope that you will have a wonderful experience while you're here. And if this is not your first time, then welcome back. Um, Marcelo is in Brazil, as you probably know. He's visiting with his parents, and uh, he, but he wants us to worship. And Taylor Stone is in place of Marcelo this morning, and we want to thank Taylor for his work with us this morning. As we are in our summer re reading series today, we're talking about the presence of God. So let's hear these words also from the Psalms, from Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us stand as we begin our time of worship together with a mighty fortress is our God.
Greek words of the, for the Christian faith of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We are... sing I stand amazed in the presence let us sing together
invite our children ages kindergarten through fourth grade now to go to the gathering place for a special time of learning. We are gathering cards, gift cards from Amazon for our teachers because we love our teachers. And uh, Maynard Elementary School and Pond Gap Elementary School are going to receive these cards. And uh, speaking of Maynard Elementary, Michael Rogers, as you know, had surgery this past week and he is doing very well, as I understand. And so keep him, keep Michael Rogers in your prayers as you go through this week. We're going to take an offering, so let us go to God in prayer. Lord, we are here just to praise you and worship you, and we are in awe of your never-ending presence and love for us. We praise you for all the ways you bless us as a church and as your people. We know that there are so many needs in our congregation, and as, as we gather today, we pray that you would help us to be encouragers to all those who are sick in mind or in body. Help us to be friends to those who are lonely. And in our community, help us to really see those who feel invisible and to listen to people who feel forgotten. Lord, most of all, we want to follow you and to love others as you love us. We pray that you would accept our gifts that we give this morning for your will and for your glory. It is in the name of your Son, Jesus, that we pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
going to read Psalm 139 responsibly with the congregation doing a part, I will do a part, and our worship leaders will do a part. And they're going to begin with a musical response to this, to this psalm. The words will be on the screen, but if you want to follow along how this goes in the hymnal, you have a hymnal in front of you in the, in the rack there. And that hymnal and that Psalm 30, 139 is on page 854 if you would like to follow along there or you can just follow along on the screen. Search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. You pursue me behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. I go from your spirit. Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and night wraps itself around me. Even the darkness is not part of me. The night is as bright as day. The darkness is as light as me. My inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for you are fearful and wonderful. Wonderful are your works. You know me very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes behold my unformed substance. In your book, all the days. Every day before they came to me. How profound to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I can count them, they are more than the same. When I come to the end, I still believe. is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Good morning. I'm Charles, one of the other pastors at Cokesbury, and I'm glad that you're here, that we had this time together. Marianne, for someone who is filling in at the last minute, you have just blown us away. Thank you. Thank you. We've been doing our summer reading. You've been reading through the Psalms. I challenged you a few weeks ago to read all 150 of them each week. <laughs> Just checking in, see how you're doing. Um, I hope you are reading through them. We've been talking about the Psalms as being Jesus' prayer book. And we've talked through some of these. That first week we talked about the Psalm that Jesus sang and lived as the Good Shepherd. Then we went on to talk about the psalm that Jesus referred to as he talked with Nicodemus, telling him that God loved the whole world, including you, you, small you, in the vast universe. Then last week, we remembered the psalm that Jesus sang while hanging on the cross, a song of despair and of hope, a hope in a God that would save and rescue. And so this week we talk about Psalm 139 and 121, but 139 in particular. It's one of my favorites. It's just been a psalm that has been sung and in my heart really throughout my life. Psalm 139. And, and I want you to think of this, there's this marvelous poem from the late 1800s called The Hound of Heaven. And, and it applies to, it, it comes out of reading this psalm. Francis Thompson wrote, The Hound of Heaven. The first lines begin, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind and in the midst of tears. I hid from him. And under running laughter, up vistaed hope I sped, but with unhurrying chase and shot precipitated, adown titanic glooms of chasmed fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after me. And then it goes on. It's a very long poem, but it goes on and on. But Thompson's poem, this poem, is a very elaborate, uh, older English way of talking about a pursuing God, a God that doesn't leave us alone, a God who guards the flock, who doesn't leave the flock until one is lost, and then who leaves everything and goes after that one, that one. So in this case, the hound of heaven is God's grace. It pursues the wandering human soul until the soul realizes there's nowhere left to go except back to God. You see, no matter where the soul, where we seek happiness in the world, it will inevitably be disillusioned and we go back to God. Many years ago, as I was uh, beginning in ministry, on a Friday afternoon, the bishop called me. Now, now I don't know if that strikes terror into your life, <laughs> but as a young pastor, it did me. The church secretary said, oh, uh, the bishop's on the line and wants to talk to you. And the first thought I had was, uh, not right now. I'm busy. I uh, don't really want to talk to him. But anyway, he said, Charles, I've got a problem and you are the person that's going to help me solve it. And I thought, man, I'm moving already. I've only been here a year or so. He said, a friend of yours, Donald Davis, is supposed to speak in Mississippi on Monday and he is sick. And he has said, you are the one to be his replacement. And so, you will go to Mississippi on Monday. We've already made flight arrangements for you, and uh, you will need to get ready to teach a workshop. You'll teach one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Well, it was kind of a shock to me. I, I went home. I said, 
how am I going to do this? Janice said, ah, you'll do fine. You can talk about anything. <laughs> it's great to have a support, isn't it? She said, I said, yeah, but he called me on Friday to do it on Monday. She said, ah, don't worry about it. You just, if you'd known sooner, you were just worried about it longer. So I tried to get ready on that Saturday. I still had to preach on Sunday morning, and then I went to get this flight that was to take me from, you know how it is when you leave from Knoxville, you, you fly to Atlanta, and then to Memphis, and then to Starkville. You know, I could have driven almost in that time. Anyway, we took off in Atlanta in the rain, or, or in Knoxville in the rain. We went to Atlanta where we landed in storms. We went from Atlanta in the storms to Memphis, which was under a tornado watch. <laughs> And it was horrible landing. We landed there, and then they said, oh, that flight to Starkville, you can just wait. We're going to do that tomorrow morning. We laid on the floor at the airport to get some sleep and rest that night. The tornadoes were so bad that we had to be taken away from windows and put in central hallways to be away from this horrible, horrible storm. And then... At uh, 4.30 a.m., they came around and said, okay, come on, we're going to try to get this, pl I love this, try to get this plane off the ground. <laughs> Not like we're leaving. No, we're going to try. Well, we'll give it a shot. So, we get in the plane. It's still dark. Uh, the clouds are heavy. You can see nothing. And we take off. And we're getting up, and we get just up enough that we're above the clouds. I am a nervous wreck uh, through all of this. And we're going along. I'm sitting on the right side of the plane. And I look out the right window. We're above the clouds now, and it's just a sea of white below us. You can't see where we are or anything. Just that. But there's the full moon setting on the tip of the right wing. And I looked across the aisle and through the other window, and there was the sun rising. And the words that came to my mind were, if I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. And somehow it became okay after that. But I was going to teach how to tell stories and preach. That was my assignment. And so, in order to do that, you have to tell stories to show people how it's done. And I was thinking about, okay, what am I gonna tell? What am I gonna tell? And, and then I thought about the booklet I was working on for the National Park at the time was a book for the, called The Churches of the Smokies. It's still out there, still available in park visitor centers, but it's about the seven church buildings that are preserved and still standing in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And to do that, I had to go to all these churches. You don't ask a preacher to write a book about churches and expect it to be about architecture. It was about the people, the people who had worshiped there. And I had to attend these churches because all seven of them still have annual reunions and gatherings. And so I went. And, and then the, the way it works is that everybody shows up at this church, all the descendants of those that had grown up around this church, that had been a part of this church. And when I was writing this, and in this time, there were many people alive who had been born in the Smokies before it was a park. And so I got to hear their stories. And I learned one thing over the, that year of listening to all of those stories is that after the service, the group would eat lunch and then they would divide into two groups, the men and the women. And I learned that men are better storytellers than women. Now there's a reason for that. It's because women are too accurate. <laughs> Women seem to think facts are important. Men, not, not troubled with that. I heard a guy in Catalucci Valley say, I always tell the truth even if I have to lie to do it. 
And, and there I was standing in Catalucci Valley, Gudger Palmer, who lived to be 101, was sitting there telling a story. And I just walked up to the group. He's already in the story. He says, it was the best dog I ever had. He said, that dog could hunt anything, anytime, anywhere. He said, we was haying, and we were putting the hay up in the barn. And, and we told people, don't go over there. It's rotten over there in that part of the barn. Okay, that's the funniest part of the story for me. I love the fact that the men didn't repair it. They just said, avoid it. I don't know if you know any men like that. But anyway, you know, somehow it'll get better on its own. But they said Bill Gass couldn't stand it. And he went over and stood there and did this and fell through. Well, when they pulled him out, there underneath in the dirt, clear as day, fox footprints. He said, we walked around the barn three times looking at the stone foundation that would have allowed a fox to come through. And he said, we couldn't find a hole big enough for a mouse to go through. Reckon how this happened. I don't know. What do you think? They got to talking back and forth, back and forth. And finally, one of them said, I know what happened. This dog walked through here the night before your dad built the barn and left these tracks. He said, boys, dad built this barn 75 years ago. Well, they argued about it a while, but they finally decided that that, in fact, is what had happened. This dog had walked through there 75 years ago. They built the barn on top of it, and it protected the tracks. One of them said, go get Skeeter. He said, what do you mean? You've said over and over again that dog could hunt anything, anytime, anywhere. Go get the dog. He said, boys, the dog came through here 75 years ago. You said anything, anytime, anywhere. They got to chanting it at him. Anything, anytime, anywhere. Well, he thought he'd been bragging about the dog too much, so he decided to go get it and just get it over with. Everybody would have a good laugh. So they put the dog down in there, sniffed around, suddenly, oh, she jumped up out of the hole, came around to the outside of the barn, exactly to the spot where the tracks had led on the inside. She sniffed around and she took off. Oh, oh. All of a sudden, she jumped up in the air. Oh, oh. Jumped up. Oh. He said, what's she doing that for? He said, boys, you know good and well we had a fence that ran down through there. <laughs> that fox must have been jumping over that fence. <laughs> oh, yeah, they said. She got out in the field. They said, what is she doing that for? He said, boys, you know we didn't cut them trees down until about 20 years ago. <laughs> She's having to run around all them trees that that fox went around. They heard, oh, 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 oh. They went over the pond, little bubbles. So what is she doing that for? He said, we didn't build that pond till 10 years ago. She's having to run along the bottom where the fox was to find out which way it went. She came out the other side. Up on the ridge, down over by the creek, uh, over near the gap, all night long. Said it was, it was dark as ever. And, and we couldn't even see her, but we could hear her. This went on night after night. For three weeks, she'd come home, eat a little bit, and go back out every night. But then after three weeks, nothing. No sound. No, no sign of her, nothing. They, they, they blew the horn. They... they put food out, they put a picture on milk cartons, everything they could think of, you know, to find this dog. And nothing. And then, about three months later, Gudger got a phone call. Mr. Palmer, yes. Catalucci, North Carolina, yes. You have a dog named Skeeter? Yes. I'm Sergeant Miller with the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania Police Department. We answered a break-in call last night at a used clothing store downtown Pittsburgh, and we got there, and the plate glass window had been smashed in, and we found your dog with your tag and phone number on it, growling at an old fox fur coat over in the corner. <laughs> he said, well, she finally found it, you know? She finally found it. 
And he said, uh, Mr. Palmer, we just want to know, do you want your dog back? He said, Law, yeah, I want that dog back. He said, well, we checked on that. It's going to cost about $800 to fly her down to you on Delta. He said, boy, that's a good dog, but it ain't no $800 dog. <laughs> he said, what about bussing her down here? Well, we checked on that as well. Of course, her being a dog, she'll have to come greyhound. And he said, um, <laughs> he said, we checked on that. It's cost about $250. You'll have to go over to Asheville and pick her up. He thought, boy. He said, reckon how much that fella wants for that dog. For that, for that, not the dog, for the fox fur coat. He said, I don't know, I have to call you back. He called him back in just a few minutes, said, I checked with him. It's a used clothing store. He thinks he sold it three times already. He'll give it, he'll sell it to you for $20. Goodger said, mail it to me. <laughs> stay with me, stay with me. So about a week later, here came the mail truck, the dog just running right behind it, you know, right on, up to the house. Now, friends, that is Psalm 139, a God that will not give up, a God that will pursue you always. And it doesn't matter where we go, what we do, it doesn't matter, it's, remember, it's anything any time, anywhere. God is there. Anything, anytime, anywhere. You're the thing. Anyone, anytime, anywhere. You see, that is the picture of God the psalmist is trying to give you. Listen to the words of the other psalm. But I want you to listen for three things. I want you to listen very carefully. I want you to listen for anything, anytime, and anywhere. I lift up my eyes to the hills from where will my help come. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Psalm 121. It tells us about a wide awake God that will not let anything come between us. Did you listen to the words? Did you listen? You, your, you, 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 repeated throughout this. Even you, this wide awake God watches. Any time, any day, any night, anywhere, you're going out and you're coming in. I mean, I've told you a silly story about a hunting dog, which you will not soon forget. In fact, you will only forget half of it. Because you will tell this to someone else and then you'll say, I don't remember what he said next. But you'll get to the end. But I told you a silly story about a hunting dog. I told you about a magnificent poem, A Hound of Heaven who will never give up until we're beside him. I've reminded you of an old poem, two Psalms, 139 and 121, that are all saying the same thing. You can run as far as you like. You can live any life you want, even turning your back on God, but God will not give up on you. Some people think that they have gone too far already, that they've done things in their life that have taken them too far away and there's no way to get back. That's wrong. They think that because their thoughts, their actions, that they're too far from God, that is not the case. I think about this week ahead and the week past. I think about a wedding a funeral, surgeries, recovering at home, hospice care. 
And everywhere I went, God showed up there. God was there well before me in all of those situations, looking after people, holding them, carrying them. We worship a searching, pursuing God who never, ever gives up. Never, ever gives up. A hound of heaven, if you will. Psalm 139. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there you are with me. Amen. Now, a great song that comes uh, from uh, the tradition, the black American tradition, is Stand By Me. Charles Tinley wrote this. Let's stand as we sing this. <clears throat> building, you do not leave the church. Because wherever you are, that's where the church is, because we are the church. Go in peace, loving God and your neighbor. And remember also that as you leave the building, there is one with you by your side. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.